let's talk about what we're seeing right now. We'll jump into kind of some things of the questions we're seeing. I'll start off a little bit like earlier is about what the positives and negatives are. So I think what's interesting, we've rarely gone into a, a cycle like this with those three green points. We have extremely high cost to add new construction, so we really are not oversupplied other than office product. We've got continued surprisingly strong rent in favored asset classes, which again is almost everything but real, uh, office product. And despite the Fed's best efforts, we've got a job market that continues to be extremely strong. At the other side of it, we've got a rapid move in funding costs. We've got a rapid, you know, it's no longer a penalty to sit in cash, so people can wait to see what happens. We've got bank stress tests. We've got liquidity issues. We've got quantitative tightening. And we keep talking about recession risk. So we really have a, a very bifurcated outcome where normally we would not have the green side when we were going through this type of correction. I think people are very focused on the financing markets. We've had a, quite a bit of volatility to talk about. And I think you know, we've gotten, we got used to 10 years of 25 to 4.5% cost of capital in real estate. Now we're dealing with 6 to 8 to 10% cost of capital. We may be dealing with some recession if the Fed's successful in what they seem to be focused on. Can we withstand that? So let's jump into the big issue is obviously rates. And this is just the Fed funds movement of rates over the last three tightening cycles. And Rich will talk probably more about this, but the blue is how fast we tightened, raised rates pre-COVID. We did 200 basis points over 24 months. The orange is what we did pre-GFC. We did about 400 basis points. We did that over two years. This time we've raised rates you know, over 500 basis points in almost 12 months and potentially going higher. I think what's interesting about, you know, we're a capital intensive business. What's amazing to me is we haven't broken very much for that big of a move. So it has broken the banks. We've totally destabilized the bank funding. The value of retail deposits has been totally disrupted. And that obviously is rolling into the funding markets for real estate. And this just kind of illustrates what really is going on. So this is the price of single family, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, government guaranteed home loan securities. That was something the, the Fed and the banking regulators really effectively gave capital relief to buy for banks. So back on the left-hand side, back in December 2021, typical bank was paying 25 basis points for deposits, and they were buying government guaranteed mortgages that paid 2.5% and they were levered nine to one. So you buy $100 million of, of, uh, of securities, you put up $10 million of, depo of equity, and you borrow $90 million from your depositors. Fast forward to today, that movement in rates, we've now wiped out 20 points on those bonds. That's why nearly every non-SIFI bank on a mark-to-market -market basis is not solvent. So that is the biggest funding pressure issue in our system. And that's just the size, I think, back to the positives. These are bank failures going back to the GFC. So the orange line is the total assets. We had 375 billion of assets fail in 2009 of banks for that assets. We've already had 500 billion fail in just three banks. <clears throat> At the same time, system's twice as big as it was. So to be apples to apples, we need to get to 800. We may get to 800 this year. But that's pretty amazing when you see that relativity and the market feels pretty good still. Um, and this is what's going on in the funding down at the bank. So the blue line is the top 25 bank, banks in the US. What percentage of their loans are in commercial real estate going back over since 2005? So roughly 18 years. So you see the banks went from, the big banks went from 10% in real estate down to about 6.5% real estate. Every other bank, it's all the regionals, et cetera, kept their balance sheets at about 30% in real estate. But the difference is the smaller bank's growth in deposits was much, even much faster than the big banks. So this is what it looks like in total loan amount. So the big banks, top 25 banks, none of them are going to fail, have roughly $850 billion on their balance sheets. The small banks have two trillion on the balance sheet. So that is the issue going on, why we see strains in the, in the, in the, particularly in the bank funding market, because those banks are super important to our society, super important to the local economy, super important to real estate, and the Fed has totally destabilized their funding costs 
because somebody can just move their money tomorrow on their phone. Um, this is where, you know, Fed funds, we all, I'll let Richard talk about where rates are going. All of us in the real estate industry always have a hope that rents are, rates are going down, so the market tells us that. We hope that's true. Um, but this is the employment picture. The orange line is, quote, unquote, real unemployment, and the blue line is headline unemployment. I mean, this is just amazing how strong the employment picture is. And again, we have these real headwinds around cost of capital and around office demand, but we got these amazing tailwinds around the strength of the underlying economy. So talk about commercial real estate debt. It's a, uh, basically a $5 trillion market. It's one that's super important. We're obviously are, are a, a asset heavy industry. Um, this is kind of the mix in 2022. That was what the market looked like. There was about $600 billion of debt originated in, 19, in 2022. Life companies, which have the most stable funding, did about 15% of it. They're almost always about 15% of the business. The purple is Fannie and Freddie. They're about 25% of the business, alive and well, providing mo money for the housing. The debt funds were about, in mortgage reach, about 90 billion of, fi of financing, and the banks were roughly 185, 200 billion. So that's the look of the debt markets. And the tr tricky part right now is the bank, banks are full. The life companies are being very selective. CMBS is priced very wide, but it is the path to get out and the agencies are just fine. So what we're waiting for is the banking system to stabilize more, and in particular for more money to flow in from the bond markets, from other fixed income classes, back into our class very, via CMBS. We'll talk about that. I have just a really quick question. In the banks, how much of that's construction debt and how much of it is permanent? Uh, I don't know that exactly, but I'm guessing that it is 20% at most construction. Oh, at 25%, most. 25% oh. yeah, at most. Uh, it's probably 15 to 20, something like that at most. I mean, I think that's the other thing is, from a fundamental standpoint, that pressure on the banking system is really cutting off new construction. So it's particularly, you know, we have a little bit of overbuilding, particularly in the apartment space and five or six different markets. That's getting cut off very quickly. A little overbuilding, some people feel like, in a little bit of the logistics space, that's getting cut off very quickly. So all this stuff is, is making the value of existing assets much better, but it's making it very difficult to deal with your loan when it rolls. So the good news is, so this is the corporate bond market. This is investment grade corporate bonds, triple B and better, spreads over the last five years. So all real estate debt ultimately gets priced relative to corporate investment grade corporate bonds. Every life company picks that. This is the, uh, these are, and, and these are the, the CMB, the, it's a little bit different index, but uh, the real spreads are about 10 base points higher, but this is the trend line. The good news is the trend line is very healthy in the corporate bond market. Spreads are back to basically where they historically love, average out, and that's positive for us. But this is what real estate debt is costing today. So the light blue bars on the left, the left three bars are 10-year fixed rate debt for you know, kind of the best of the best, logistics in particular. The right-hand side is, and the right, left -hand side is 10-year fixed, right-hand side is five-year floating hedged out. You see the blue is where we were just the beginning of last year, and the purple is where we are today. So we've kind of gone from three to six there are selectively places you can get debt in the, in the mid fives in the housing space, but by and large, most debt is five and a half to six. If you're in the office business, that is seven and a half to 10. It's a very, very expensive, but you see that change in value has been the huge impact on the system. We're having basically doubling the base funding cost in our industry. Um, so we'll talk about transaction activity and capital flows. So this is first quarter, excuse me, first five months transaction activity. So through May 31st, that far, look, look at the far left bar, that is 2019. So a more normalized market. The purple is basically housing. Um, the light blue is logistics and the red is office related and life science related. So we're down about 66% in transaction activity versus what we did last year. Uh, in the U.S., but we're only down about 40% from what we did in 19. And if somebody was, was going to tell me, hey, I'm going to double the cost of funding 
uh, that quickly. How fast do transactions go down? I would expect they go down a lot more. You'll see the big change is look at the red bar, office-related transactions, the red, red line, office-related office in 19, office-related to today. So office continues to be the place where people are, are, have concern. It's the biggest K-shaped recovery in terms of what office works, what locations work, and what, uh, what do not. But that's clearly impacting that transaction activity quite a bit. So in terms of fund flows, we keep talking about, hey, there's a wall of capital out there to be, to be put to work. So this is total closed in. So closed in private equity focused funds, closed in funds focused on real estate in North America. And you see there's a huge amount of dry powder, call it 215 billion of dry powder. There's very little of that dry powder, particularly in the closed in space, focused on core and core plus uh, transaction tr return profile. So core would be six to seven unlevered IRRs. Core plus would be seven to eight percent unlevered IRRs. There's plenty of money, but it needs a levered 13 to 20 IRR in a debt market that is costing six to eight percent to do. So that's what's putting some pressure on pricing. Is a lot of capital, but that capital is dedicated and cannot be released. It's dedicated towards return strategies that require pricing, particularly given the movement in debt, to come down. Um, this is kind of the core, the biggest core source of capital is the open-ended Odyssey funds. Uh, and that's the net inflows and net outflows over the last seven, eight years. You see it's been basically flat. The big elephant in the room is there's 275 billion of GAV in those funds. And right now there's over 40 billion in a queue to get out. So again, you that took a big core buyer out of the market. Another big core buyer was the non-traded REIT space. So B REIT, S REIT, all ones we see in the press. So this is quarter by quarter, net, the green is net inflows, the red is redemptions, quarter by quarter over the past two years. Slide kind of speaks for itself, not a lot of uh, net buying there. And then we always look at what's going on with the offshore investors coming into the US. So what I like to look for in terms of what the future holds on offshore investment is the trend in buying U.S. corporate debt, not U.S. sovereign debt, because that's more of a currency trade. U.S. corporate debt is you're making a, you know, it's le less liquid, you're making a decision that you want to invest in the dollar in particular, and you're taking some credit risk. So you see, as the Fed has been tightening very quickly, you saw that big drop off, that's the Fed tightening. As the Fed is stabilized and people feel like we're at the end of the tightening regime, you are seeing more money come in from offshore that typically ultimately comes our way. It's still, we're not seeing it yet. This is, a lag, this is a forward indicator. We are a lagging indicator, but that you know, we view as a positive. positive. Tricky part is we, our rates are so much higher than everybody else in the world that the cost to hedge buying a dollar denominated asset back to your local currency is quite high. So this is what a Korean account is looking at. A Korean investor who has their money in Korean won, this is what it costs to hedge. This goes back to 19, so back at the left-hand side, you were losing about 120 base points. If you bought a 5% cap rate here in the US, hedged it back to local currency, you got roughly about 3.8. That currency cost today, because our rates have gone much higher than the rest of the world, is close to 2.3. So this is again a headwind, but the tailwind is, is that. And then the last tailwind is just how much money is growing in the uh, oil producing regions. These are the, is the Middle East, the growth in net assets there. Uh, the reality is that is a lot of net new available capital, uh, but every, there's the, probably every major investor there is having 12 meetings a day. People clearly recognize that they have the capital. People need the capital. So it's being, I would say, very judicious. Let's talk about pricing briefly. Um, so these are, this is Green Street data. So the blue bars are what, the Green, what, what Green Street's estimate of average in-place cap rates are for the various asset classes. So industrial to four, three cap rate, you saw an announcement yesterday, large deal we did between Blackstone and Prologis, that was roughly a three nine in place, a five seven five mark to market. So you see industrial continues to be the place that people are most aggressive. Number one, it's bit, continues to be hard to add supply. People don't, don't want more industrial in their cities. Two, it's very expensive to add supply. Three, there's limited regulations. Nobody breaks your window if you raise their rent. And that is what continues to be the darling of the industry. Housing continues to hold in there. 
you know, public market cap rates, I mean, the orange bars are public market cap rates, the, uh, you know, we're seeing in the mid fives. You know, we see if you're under 150 million, multifamily product still being very sought after if you get anywhere near four and three quarters to five. So that, you know, continues to be very uh, focused. I move retail, people are seeing rents. We've not really built any retail in over 12, 13 years. You're actually starting to see leases that were 10 year leases done start to roll up in rent and open air retail. And so you're seeing retail as a place that people feel more confident in. The biggest issue is office, and that is 100, almost 100% concentrated in office built pre-2000. So you're seeing the public markets are trading office streets somewhere in the mid nines. Um, the private market, you know, theoretically is mid sevens, but that's where we're seeing the biggest, biggest stress. This is the change in private market value. So office under Green Street data is down about 25%. We're seeing situations with multi-tenant office that's older, um, and particularly if it's not as well located, down as much as 50%, 60%. Um, But then you look at apartments down 20, that has purely been a rate movement, this reality of, you know, we got down to, you know, in the three and a half to three and three quarter cap rates because we could finance at two to two and a half. We're now at, from, from three to three, three and a half, three and three quarter cap rates to four and three quarter cap rates. You move cap rates 100 basis points off of a very low base, you get that type of percentage change in valuation. And then this is what I think is really driving investors. This is Green Street's data again. The orange dots are the percentage of your NOI that goes to CapEx, to leasing commissions, TIs, and building improvements. The blue bars are the expected compounded NOI growth for the next three years. And so you see on the left-hand side there in the logistics industrial space, NOI, because there's such a big mark-to-market in these leases, it's expected to grow 10.5% per year for three years, and you're spending about 14% of your NOI in CapEx. Go to office there, you've got roughly 1.5% expected growth in NOI in the office REITs, and you've got close to 30% historically of what your CapEx is in office going in, for, as a percentage of NOI. So the investors continue to move towards recurring cash flow with inflation protection and continue to be nervous about big CapEx assets and assets that require material CapEx to continue to be competitive. So final observations, I think, you know, we continue to advise clients we've got to be very, very focused on these business plans uh, to, to maintain, you know, when does the cap burn off? When does the maturity look, happen? You know, the banks are, are being pressuring to get repayments. So being able to, you know, deal with a both some level of recession, be able to deal with 68% rates when, when that rolls is that what we are viewing is very important. I think the second thing that's much different this cycle than we've had is every other cycle we've been through, by and large, you could extend and pretend because the Fed came to your rescue and lowered base rates. When the banks, the funding mechanism is making them very unstable and they have to pay 5% to keep material deposits in the banks, there's no one coming to the rescue. And so the when those when you have to start paying seven, eight percent because base funding costs is five those issues are coming to four very, very quickly. Um, we're hopeful in the second half, hopefully Richard, uh, you know, we're hopeful that we get a pause, hopefully in rate, maybe we get some reductions later in the year of the forward curve. Hopefully the, the Fed doesn't poke the banks too much this quarter. Uh, they're doing their annual uh, stress test right now. We're hoping maybe we get a pause in the 100 billion a month that we're laying roll off the balance sheet. Uh, but we're waiting for all that to happen. And so while, while we're waiting for that to happen, very focused on smaller transactions, very focused on those asset classes that are really working and people finding ways, because at, at, at the end of the day, I think that you know, we're seeing people long-term want to have inflation protection. They don't want to sit in fixed income and have their earnings eroded, but they want recurring cash flow. And so those asset classes that can give recurring cash flow with inflation protection continue to be the darling. So with that, I think I'm up against my 10 o'clock. That was- I think we have time for one question for Mike, <laughs> please. In the uh, banking slide, you showed roughly like 29% of the smaller regional banks in real estate. Do you have a sense for how much of that is in office? I mean, we've, we've tried to do some work on that, but don't have yeah. a figure. I mean, you, you, uh, office has is, is historically been 30 to 40% of the trading stock 
in the US. Um, so the best estimate's 30 to 40%, but that's not with any good data behind it. Um, you do get a lot of kind of owner-occupied related product in there, so it's not a great, you know, a, but it, it, it is it not, it's definitely not less than 20, 25% of that 30% that is invested in real estate. Okay, well, other than the fact that, very quick. Do you guys see all the office markets across the country? Clearly, it's been brutally beat up. Are there markets where you're seeing price per pound where from an intrinsic value standpoint, you guys think, man, this feels like it's on the map and we're interested? I think you're starting to, if you have any belief that San Francisco is a long-term city because of its beauty and concentration of, I mean, San Francisco is getting dirt cheap, right? We're trading a vacant building at 550 Cal for 125 bucks a foot. I mean, it doesn't have views, not a great asset, but I mean, that, things are getting very cheap there. Um, you know, I think that is a place, I think Manhattan is starting to get, you know, you're seeing the resurgence in Manhattan, you're getting pricing there down for some assets that are decent quality assets in the 500, $600 a foot. So I think if you can find a place where you feel like the politics are gonna to bail you out longer term around public safety and around rationality around how we manage the cities, you know, some of the bets that can be made right now, you're gonna to have to throw away the computer, but they are super cheap. So, uh, okay, that was great. Thank, Thank you very much.